Bless you guys. You can be seated. I am um, started thinking about the things in my life that that I'm proud of. I'm proud of my wife. I'm proud of my kids. I, I'm proud of the things that they do. And a lot of times when, when we hear that word proud or pride, we think of something sinful, but I want you to think of pride or, or being proud of something in this sense, uh, meaning accomplishment or satisfaction. I'm proud in it, uh, not self-sufficiency. Okay, that, that's, that's the pride that is sinful. I, I'm talking about accomplishment, being satisfied in, in what another has done. And I begin to think, are we proud of our church? What is the sense of satisfaction that we have? The, the only way that we could be proud as a body is if we are doing exactly what the Lord Jesus has commanded us to do. Because this is his church, right? This is his church. But what I'm looking at is for what, what would make the Lord Jesus look at, at, at this church and say, man, that's my church. That's my church. That's what I'm talking about. These people are doing, like I laid it out for them, I love this church, right? I mean, he loves the body, but what would stand out? Because a lot of people have a lot of things that they're proud about when it comes to church. Some churches are proud of their stained glass windows. Some churches are proud of the songs that they sing. Other churches, they're proud of the number of people that they have in their seats every Sunday. Some Churches are proud of their celebrity pastors. Some churches are proud of what they have done in missions. And the list goes on and on and on. They're proud of their theology. They're proud of their liturgy. But what kind of church would Jesus look at and say, that's my church? That's my church. What are the marks of the Lord's church? So that's what we're going to look at a little bit today. We're going to go uh, and look at what a New Testament church looks like. And we're going to see... Uh, what we are and where we are in ministry and missions. And for a basis of this, we're going to look at the very last few verses of the book of James. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, we're in the book of James. We'll be in chapter 5. Uh, to give you a little background on James, he is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, I can't think of a more disturbing title to be the brother of Jesus. I mean, that would have to be tough, right? Right? Okay, mom looks over at James. Why can't you be more like your brother? I, 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 can't, I can't, mom. He's, he's the son of God, right? It's not going to work for me. During James's leadership, the church in Jerusalem goes through a very difficult time. 20 years of famine and persecution on and off. James is a pillar of leadership there. He's a peacemaker. He's known as a guy of wisdom and a guy of courage. In fact, he was martyred to death for his belief in Jesus Christ. Now the goal of the letter that James wrote to the church is not to produce any kind of new theology to the church. That was not his intention. Uh, what James is trying to do is to really get in your business and say, are you living what you believe? Are you claiming a belief that doesn't look like life? And so that's what James does. And his most uh, I guess, memorable verse, faith without works is, all right, hey, you guys did a little bit better in first service on that. You were quicker on the draw. Faith without works is dead. He was letting them know that what you do, how you live should be a mirror, a reflection of what you believe, and, and it should line up. And it's not enough to say and, and affirm that you have faith and love in God and that you're concerned about others if you're not willing to show that practically in life. And that's what the entirety of the book of James is about. It is 12 distinct teachings on different subject matter. It's almost like 12 essays if you want to read the book of James that way, that he's going to bring up different subject matter. And all of it is pointing to living a life that is uh, looking like Jesus Christ. And if you look at where, where he quotes and what his uh, letter echoes, Sermon on the Mount and the book of Proverbs, you can echo back and forth between those two all through the book of James. But anyway, we get to the, to the last chapter here. And in some of the last verses, we see the earmarks of the early church, earmarks that I think we would be wise as a church to look at, to decipher and line ourselves up with. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. 
Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Or if you grew up with the King James Version like I did, the, the, the prayer of a faithful man availeth much, right? It brings about much. So when James writes this, he says, if you're suffering, you pray. If you're cheerful, you sing. If you're sick, you call for people to come and pray for you. He is putting the initiative on the individual. Are you suffering? Then what do you need to do? I need to pray. Am I the one who is cheerful? Then what do I need to do? I need to sing. Am I the one who is sick? Then what do I need to do? I need to call for these people to come and pray for me. And then what are those people supposed to do? Their part. You see everyone moving and doing their part. This is the mandate. But this is what's so difficult for me is that Sunday after Sunday rolls by and we neglect to lean on one another for prayer and support. We are the body of Christ. We are to lean upon one another. You know what we call this area right down here? We call this our altar area. In the Old Testament, the altar was a place where people would bring sacrifices, a place where people would bring their burdens so that they could have uh, communication with God, so that they could confess their sins. It was a place where they could, quote, unquote, do business with God. It was the altar. Now, I understand at the turn of the century, what we had was people began to do altar calls where they would call people to the altar, and it was primarily for the sinner to come and to confess their sins at an altar. It didn't start with people standing down here praying for you. It started really with a bench that would go across the front, and people would sit at that bench, and they called it the anxious bench, and they would sit there as they were anxiously awaiting someone to come and pray for them so that they could uh, know for sure that they... Uh, had a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? So a- as we progress, we, some people come to see the altar, even with contempt, oh, why do we do altar calls? This place, to me, is sacred. Let me tell you why. There's nothing magical about this area down here. There's, there's nothing that if you come and touch this, that you're going to like feel electricity in your body. What this is for me, and what I hope it is for you, it is a place where when you take a step of faith, there's a dynamic that occurs in you. You understand? I, I, I get it. God is everywhere, and he, and he exists omnipresent. And, and he can save you at your house. He can save you uh, out on the boat in the middle of the ocean, whatever the case may be. But there's a dynamic that takes place when someone takes a step in faith, and it is a witness to other people of what is going on. Now, here's my thing. This altar area is not just for the lost. It is also for the saved person just as much. Because I don't know about you, but when I gave my life to Jesus and he saved me, when he brought me out of the pits and he set me on a solid rock, when he did that for me, I still had problems after I got saved. Any of you? Oh, 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 y'all too. Right. Right. So this is what amazes me, that the mandate is to call on one another for prayer and for support, yet we see that our altars empty week after week after week. And, and sometimes it's people say, I, I don't want other people to look at me and think that I've got issues. Well, newsflash, we all know you've got issues. I've got issues. We all have problems that we deal with. And here's the thing, you don't need the hired holy man just to pray for you. If you see a brother or a sister come down, you should be here praying with them. You understand? This is, oh man, we need to redefine what it's all about, praying and caring for one another. We need to redefine that. We need to break all the norms that you, that you grew up thinking about. That Look, I'll tell you, my testimony, when I got saved, I thought I had to walk an aisle to get saved. That, that's how steeped in tradition that I was. I thought that I had to walk the aisle, so I had to wait for the preacher to get done preaching. And man, he preached long that day. That's not what this is about. 
This is a place for you to lay your burdens down. The gospel is just as much for the believer as it is the unbeliever. And this is, this is a place, and, and, and I get off on this because I, I'm talking about what the church is, and I, I'm looking at what James says. If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church to pray for him. Is anyone suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing. There, there's a place for all of us, and this all fits together. And maybe James is giving this simple reminder to these believers because maybe, just maybe, Instead of singing praise, maybe they were sulking. Maybe instead of calling on church leaders, they were talking about them. Maybe instead of lifting up their church, they were condemning it and not loving it. Maybe that's the case. Perhaps that's the reason. I don't know. But in these few verses that we just read, James has given the sneak peek into how the early church operated. What gave it meaning? why it was the church. And if we want to be those that have church that's lined up with the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think we need to take note of that. So what should we be? What should we do as the body, as as the church that we would want Jesus to look at and say, that's my church. We need to be a praying church. It's instructed that so much of this passage has to do with prayer. And, And for the believer, prayer is not an optional deal. In fact, the the prophet Samuel would actually pray to God and ask for forgiveness for prayerlessness. There's a theologian by the name of Tennyson that said, more things are robbed by prayer than this world dreams of. We believe this, but we do not practice this. And it's so true, so true. For many, many, many people, many times, prayer is the last option and not the first instinct. So what is prayer? Prayer. Prayer is not a mystical process that we call out on God as our celestial bellhop. That's not what prayer is. Uh, We're not ordering God to do our will. In fact, prayer is more of us reporting for duty to get his will done, is what it should be for us. Prayer is communicating with and hearing from God, and it becomes effective when our will is lined up with the will of God. Now, do you know where you can find the will of God? The Word of God, absolutely. One person gets the A, the rest of you mumbled it. (laughs) The Word of God, that is where we find the will of God. It is revealed to us through His Word. God has revealed the entirety of Himself in the 66 books that we call the Bible. And the entirety of God is in this book revealed to us. And this is how we know the, the mind of God, the heart of God. What does the eyes of the Spirit see? We find that in the Word of God. That's why we need to always keep the lines of communication open. What does prayer do? Well, if we look at this passage, it shows need, right? For this one, it was sickness, illness. Prayer also should lead, according to this passage, to the confession of sin. And it should be confessed. And we can't pray without honestly facing our needs. And we can't pray without honestly confessing our inadequacy in the face of a holy God. We, we just can't. Any time that I begin to pray, it may start out with, here's my wish list, God. But what it really ends up being is, I am so unworthy of you. You are the one that is mighty. You are the one that did it all. And you love me, and I don't even know why. You see, prayer, when people would pray, it brings the power of God into the problem. How do you pray? Do you know there's no posture for prayer? You know why we tell kids to, 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 to fold their hands and bow their heads and close their eyes? You know why we do that? So they don't punch the person sitting next to them. That's why we tell them that. There's no posture for prayer. Because if you look through the Bible, people would pray standing up. They would pray laying down. They would pray kneeling, bowing, uh, lifting hands to heaven. They would pray pounding their chest. They would pray while tearing their garments. People prayed in all kinds of different ways in the Bible. There's no posture for it. God doesn't tell us that there is a place to pray because any place will do. In the Bible, people prayed during battle, in a cave, in a closet, in a garden, on a mountainside, by a river, by the sea, in the street, in Hades, in a bed, in a home, in a prison, in the wilderness, and one guy even prayed in a fish. Can't beat that. That tops the the record there. Look, Jesus doesn't tell us 
when to pray because any time will do. Look through the scriptures. People prayed early in the morning. They prayed at noontime. They prayed three times a day. They prayed uh, at night. They prayed before and after meals. They prayed at bedtime. And Paul and Silas prayed at midnight. People pray when they're young. They pray when they're old. They pray when they're in trouble every day and always, any posture, any time, any place, under all circumstances, prayer is not only necessary, it is needful in the life of the believer. Be one who talks to God. He has made it so easy for me and you just to come before him. He has opened up the way to his throne of grace in our time of need that we could come boldly, boldly to that throne of grace that we could cast our cares on him each and every day. Second, we should be a worshiping church. Now, worship comes in a lot of different forms. What James is referring to is the, the idea of worship with singing. If anyone's cheerful, let him sing. Now, the early church was a singing church. And more than once, Paul would write letters to different churches and he would say, look, being filled with the Spirit means you're going to admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. They were a singing people, right? The early church was a singing people that carried on. There's something that happens in a singing part of worship that you can't, if you could say it, you would say it, but you can't, so you sing it. Does that make sense? Right, and, and, and like, there's, I, I'm, a, I'm a guy, like, when I get happy about something, I'll make up a song about it. That's just me. I'm like, oh, going to get some chocolate cake. <laughs> yeah, I'll just make up a song about it, and it's just fun. And that's because there's something, there's a dynamic that takes place when we begin to sing, and that's what worship is. Uh, and, and this is what, it's not, it's not incidental to what we do. It's integral to what we do. We have to be those that, that lift up in worship. And these songs that are sung, y'all, it is not just to warm you up for the sermon. That's not the, that's not the mindset here. The whole part of the singing portion of our worship is so that we can focus as one body on God and give him the glory and lift up for things that he has done. That's the whole point of that. Please don't think that it's a primer for the sermon. Uh, <laughs> I know the preaching needs a little help, but we got to prime it up a little bit. Oh, man. It's the bellows to the fire, right? Corporate worship brings this understanding and perception of the Lord that is essential for our own growth and understanding who God is. So let me tell you a few things about worship. Number one, worship delights the Father. The Bible tells us in Psalms 22.3, I think it is, that, that God inhabits the praises of his people. He inhabits the praises of his people. Now, I already told you God's omnipresent. He can be everywhere. But the place where he's most particularly comfortable is in your praise. God is delighted when you praise. I always call praise is like the, the daddy chair. Any of y'all have a daddy chair? That's the chair your daddy sat in. If any walked in the room, you got to get out of it. That's the daddy chair. When I think about praise, man, that's the daddy chair. That, that's what Father God is particularly comfortable when he is resting in the praises of his people. Let me tell you something else. Worship dethrones the flesh. Because when I walk into church, and man, Travis, when you hit those first notes, man, it didn't matter what was going on in my life previously. It didn't matter what difficulties I was facing because for those, those few songs... I've dethroned the flesh because now it's all about him. It didn't matter what was going, how difficult it was in my life. I forgot about it for, for just a little bit. And that's what worship does. That's what worship will be if you will let it be that for you. It's the place where you get tired of yourself, your problems, your concerns. You come where you can lose yourself in the identity that is the body of Christ. Worship also defines priority. There's a tendency today to emphasize worship but in a lot, of case, a lot of cases, it is worshiping the worship. And that's a subtle trap that, that folks can fall into. But what we do with Christ is way more important than what we do for him. Does that make sense, guys? Uh, more important than performing a duty or an obligation or even ministry is giving worship to the Lord. 
Ministry should be an overflow out of that, not because of that. We should be a caring church. The most powerful kingdom weapon we have is the way we love each other. It's what Jesus said. Jesus said, they will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Now, caring for people means that you lift them up and you don't put them down. (laughs) When I was in a church in Mississippi, after church was over with, we would all go eat at McAllister's Deli. Now, it was not good enough for our church just to be all together. No, we had to put a train table from one end of the restaurant to the other. It looked like a picture of the Last Supper. Everybody's sitting around it. And so we're sitting around this table, and, and, the, and the, the lady that's waiting on the tables comes to our end of the table, and we're going to be good Christian people. And we say, hey, you know what? We would like to invite you to be part of our church. And she says, I don't want to be part of your church. I was like, why? She said, you didn't hear what the people on that end of the table are saying about y'all down here on this end. <laughs> it hurts, but it's true. A preacher told me one time, if somebody will gossip with you, they will gossip about you. (laughs) Watch out. Don't talk about somebody else's problems like that. It'll come back on you. I promise it will. It's not my job or your job to point out or expose the sins of other people. It's just not our jobs. And and, and I've known sin sniffers and, man, they go, man, they'll look in Facebook at the reflection in 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 a wall and a mirror. Oh, I think they're in a bar. I can't tell. It looks like it's either a bar or a carnival. I can't tell. Like, come on. It's not our job. Not our job. Caring for people means that they're more important than the programs that we put out. Look, here's the thing. Guys, I know when when it comes to church, everybody thinks about the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. But more important than growing large, we need to remember individuals. Because that's what Jesus did. He focused on the individual, and the individual would impact the group. That's how it always worked throughout Scripture. We need to be individually based. We need to care about people. Uh, We can't become complacent uh, in in doing church that we forget the church is made up of people. That's what it's all about. We should be a witnessing church. The importance of witnessing is seen all throughout uh, the New Testament. Man, witnessing comes in a lot of different forms. Witnessing, you can do witnessing by visitation. You can do witnesses through ministry, by forming relationships. There's sharing the gospel. There's one-on-one witnessing. There's hands-on personal evangelism. That happens as witnessing. There's a lot of different ways. But here's the thing. Have you ever heard the saying, and it's been attributed to a lot of different people that didn't say it, but it says, Live, uh, oh, wit- let your life be a witness to others, and if necessary, use words. You ever heard that? Now, I want you to step back three steps and then metaphorically kick that off the side of a building. It takes words. It takes words. Here's the thing. I'm not condemning lifestyle evangelism. You should live a life that looks like you're, you're being formed into the image of Christ. You should live a life that shows that. It should be when people look at you, they're piqued in their interest to want to know, why are you doing what you do? How are you living like this? Why are you living like this? You should. But then you have to open your mouth and use words. And that is sharing the gospel, talking about what you believe. And I pray that God would give you the boldness to do that, that he would give me the boldness to do this. But it does take words because I can bake cookies for my neighbor and wave at them every time they walk out of the house. And I can wave them straight into the fires of hell if I never open my mouth to share the gospel. Foremost in any church's purpose got to be the winning of the lost. Super quick. What do we do with it? Now what? You got to get involved. You got to be involved. Your participation is needed and is better than your presence. I'm glad you are here. That is awesome. Don't let it stop there. Don't just show up. Get involved. Get involved. You say, I don't know where to get involved. Pick a ministry and go for it. If you don't like it, try something different later. You say, I have no skill or talent. Can you wipe a snotty nose? They can use you in the nursery. (laughs) Can you tie a shoe? That's where, 
Look, my first ministry uh, help was in children's church. I think a lot of people got their start in children's church. I got called in because the lady that was teaching the class of fourth and fifth grade boys could not handle them. So I got called in as a sergeant at arms to keep them at bay, right, while she's trying to teach the lesson. She jumped ship about three weeks in, and now it's all me. But I found out God revealed to me what he wanted me to do through that was to teach kids. And if I could teach kids, then he showed me I could teach adults. And and, and my thought was when I I went in there, man, they're going to put me in a closet with like 10 kids and leave me there until Jesus comes back. And that was not the case. God really began to work in my life through that. So what is it? Where's your involvement going to come from? Because you need to be involved. You need to be a participant, not just one who shows up for the show, if that makes sense. Get involved. Light is better than lightning. A guy by the name of Taylor Field who started graffiti ministries down in New York used to have this saying, be light, not lightning. He says, because lightning shows up, shows out, and then leaves. It's big bang, bright lights, but then it's done. He says, but a street light is consistent and it blesses everyone from miles away who can see it shining. Constant light. And that's what the Lord called us to be, to be light, not just lightning. Don't just show up and show out and, and, and be gone. No, to be there, to be committed. Look, the larger we grow, the more personal we need to become, right? Churches grow really large by being really good at being small. And we need to look at individuals and, and be that light, not just the lightning that blows up. Our focus needs to be big changes, not big numbers. In fact, the the old saying goes, if you want to see change, stick around for a while. It takes time. Even Jesus' plan to turn the world upside down has been in effect for about 2,000 years now. Hang in there. So there's no need for me or for you to build the church because it's already accomplished. Jesus taught that God gives faith. He builds the church. The Holy Spirit empowers the people, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So our job is to keep the course. Last thing, really quick, we are better than I can ever be. Y'all, we work as a group. We work as a team. There's no lawn rangers here. I promise you, we all have a part to play. Like, we're not even, I don't even want us to be compartmentalized, like, like a TV dinner tray, right? You got your Salisbury steak, you got your mashed potatoes that's not cooked all the way right there, you got your corn, and then what is supposed to be pudding or brownie, I don't know, that sits in this compartment here. It's all separated. I want us to be more like a seven layer dip where it just gets all, you got your black beans, you got your guacamole, yeah, you got your tomatoes and the cheese and the sour cream. Or you can't forget the sour cream. That's money. And it's all, by the, by the time you get to the end of that dip, you can't tell what's what, can you? It's just all this, this big conglomeration of mush and it's so good on a tortilla. Man, I love that stuff. Second to peanut butter, but that's good. There's power in a group. There, we're so much better together than we are alone. We can accomplish so much more together than we can by ourselves. And, and look, believers, we need each other. But just as much, this community, this world needs you. And they need us, believers, to be together, unified. And being the church that God has called us to be, not just doing church, being church. That's what we're called to do. Let's stand. I'm going to say a prayer for us. And when I get to the end of that prayer, I'm going to say amen. And when I do, If you are bearing a burden of some kind, maybe it's been for a while. You've been trying to shoulder this. Maybe nobody knows about it. I want you to come down here and either pray at this altar or let me pray with you or let somebody, bring a friend with you, somebody to pray with you. It's not yours to bear. God wants to bear that burden. Second of all, a lot of people know 
a lot about Jesus, but they don't know him. There's a lot of people that I have met in life during ministry that they have been involved in ministry, but realize that they never had a relationship with Jesus. They knew of him. They did things for him in his name, but never knew him as Lord and Savior. And that's so possible to happen in a church atmosphere that's active, that we, we, we pretend that doing becomes salvation for us, and that's not it. The gospel message is that I realize I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And only what Jesus has done can bring salvation to me. His dying on a cross and rising from the dead, that's what brings salvation. And a lot of people have never repented of their sins and accepted that in faith. And that's what it means to be saved. So maybe that might be some of you. But more than that, I know we struggle. I know we have problems. I know we deal with things because life happens to us. So when I pray and I say amen, if you're struggling with that burden, that sickness, that difficulty, tough decision to make, would you take a step of faith and come down here, whether you pray with me or not, whether you pray at this altar, I just want you to, I want, I want you to take that step of faith and see the dynamic that takes place. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your word. Lord, we want to be the church you've called us to be. We want to do the things you've called us to do. We want to function in the way that you've called us to function. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Lead us, Lord. Let your word be light and life to us. And let us go after you with reckless abandoning, being those that are bold to open our mouth, to speak our faith and our beliefs, to share the gospel. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.